take their seats. Um, we're ready to start the second talk of the morning. Um, it's my pleasure to, do, to introduce to you Abir, who has come to speak to us all the way from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Right. Um, and Hello. Abir is going to be speaking to us about, um, I think, something everyone who does data scientists um, knows and loves a little bit, um, which is dimensionality reduction and PCA, um, which is where a lot of data science starts. That's right. And over to Abir. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just before we start, I want a quick show of hands. How many of you can see in four dimensions? <laughs> right. You don't need to be here. <laughs> okay. So um, the unfortunate reality is that we can see at best in two dimensions that kind of approximates some perception of depth. So that kind of limits our senses, but data doesn't care about your feelings. So it exists in as many dimensions as it wants to. And when you want to understand it, um, you use your sensory limitations to try and draw analogies to what you can sense in two dimensions or how you can reduce high dimensional data to something that's relatable to you. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so the basic itinerary that we're going to cover is um, what exactly is data made of, which everybody is probably aware of. Why you should care about understanding, and understanding is critical, I think, uh, as compared to just predictions or accuracy and all of these things. The basic principles of actually understanding data via analysis. Um, thinking about something called the data space, and then we'll get to the algorithms. K-means clustering is something I'll briefly cover. We'll mainly talk about principal component analysis. Uh, I'll talk about TSNI a little bit, and then my patent pending 10 steps to being a data scientist. So what is data made of? It's basically just numbers, right? So you can have an image, which is pixels. You can have uh, an audio signal, which is different amplitudes and frequencies. You can have a database, and you can steal my password. Um, but the structure can get really complicated, right? Um, so it's important to try and understand what the data means, what all of these numbers at, at the ground reality of it mean. And it's important because data actually doesn't tell you anything. It's, it just exists. But to learn something from data, to, to get science from an experiment, you need to understand the experimental results, right? So um, data doesn't change, but understanding is actually fluid. And it's based on ideas and hypotheses that you can use in new situations. Data doesn't change its scale either. It has a structure that's fixed, but understanding is Multi-scale, you can understand something at the small level and use that to understand something at a different level. And finally, understanding is really what machine learning should be, right? If we're trying to learn, that doesn't just come from information existing. It comes from understanding it. So what are the basic principles of data analysis? It's pretty simple. Uh, when you don't know anything else, a data point can be known by the company it keeps. And from the company it keeps, you can actually find patterns that give you useful information. And I'll get to an example of that that should make that clear in just a few minutes. So now I want you to think about something called the data space, which is just um, a fancy way of saying it's a two-dimensional plot when you have two dimensions. So here's some data. And each row is a sample, as you can see. And each sample has two properties, as you can see. So you can actually plot this data in a two-dimensional space, right? This is, this is not hard. Why am I wasting time on this? Um, so each property is, is equally important. It's not like one is your income and the other one is the size of your toenails. Um, but we should make sure that they're scaled approximately similarly so that you don't have $10,000 of income and a two-inch toenail. Then, then you're like, wait, what's happening? So these could actually be real-life examples. You could have birds with weight and height. You could have um, bank account holders, and those could be their assets and their debt. You could have maybe uh, people ordering products, and that's the order value, and you want the highest value orders to take the least time to ship. So now let's move to three dimensions. Um, it's, it's possible, but it gets a little mucky. I mean, you can't really see the depth in this plot. And finally, when you go to high dimensions, uh, you can't plot it at all. But it is the same thing. 
you can scale up the concept of the data space and every row is just a point and each property is equally important that's important so what do you do when you can't plot this data what do you do when you can't just put it on a page um, Simple, you do what mathematics does. You go back to two dimensions and you try to see what two dimensions offers in terms of making sense. How does two dimensions help you? Um, so let's look at this data on the birds and you can see the clusters, right? It's pretty obvious, just visually. Uh, but why are the shorter birds much heavier and the taller birds lighter? This, this already tells you something. This two dimensional plot tells you something. And it's that this is probably wrong. You, you made a mistake somewhere in your pipeline, and so you fix it, and you get the right data. So those are birds where you have two clusters again. Some birds are heavier and taller. Some birds are shorter and lighter. You can see them, you can see the clusters visually, and it makes sense now, right? Just this two-dimensional plot gives you information that there are two kinds of birds, and qualitatively, um, you can say something about that. So when you go to n dimensions, you can't visually identify clusters because you can't even see n dimensions. So we need an algorithm to kind of help us do this clustering in a, in a more concrete way. And that brings us to k-means clustering. So k-means clustering is a fairly simple algorithm. It just takes in uh, all of your data, n data points in a d-dimensional space. And then you say, OK, uh, I'm guessing that there are three clusters here. I want to find what three those are. And it just gives you, e for each of the data points, which of those three clusters it belongs to. And it just does this based on some notion of closeness. Uh, like you saw, visually, we, we make clusters based on what looks close to itself. We use Euclidean distance with the Pythagoras theorem to just kind of cluster these things. And uh, the illustration on the right actually shows you how this works. It just starts out randomly, and then it starts taking averages of the nearest points to a cluster until the, cluster, until the average converges, until it stops moving. So, um, wait, that didn't work. Yeah, you can see the animation. So that's the first, those are the first four random points. And then it looks at which point is closest to each of those random four points. And then it takes the average of all of those nearest points. And it keeps doing that until the averages don't move. And then the nearest point to each of those centers is just assumed to determine what points are in that cluster. So there are four clusters here, and that's how it works. So um, I'm not here to teach you about k-means clustering. I'm actually here to tell you that there are problems with k-means clustering. Because think about it, where does the concept of a distance really make sense? Not everywhere, right? If I am talking about, say, the Netflix problem, where different people are watching different movies, how do I say that each movie is a dimension and then say, oh, well, if you've watched Reservoir Dogs but you haven't watched something else, you are somehow farther from, I, I don't know, it doesn't make sense, and I'm trying to explain that it doesn't make sense. So um, k-means clustering is useful uh, for areas where you don't need this distance uh, to be thought of too deeply. So you can use it to say which customers are similar to each other. So if you're approving a loan on 10 of them, you find the 11th guy who has a similar credit history, all of these things, and give him a loan. Customer behavior, similar way. Uh, cancer diagnosis. The properties of tumors can kind of be uh, clustered, and you can find out which ones are cancerous and which ones aren't. Uh, image classification. All the neural networks are way, way better at that. So generally, identifying trends is something that you can do easily with k-means clustering. But there are obviously limitations. It's not reproducible because it starts with four random points. Uh, the true clusters, that means how the data actually looks in the data space, might be completely random. It might not be conveniently separated for you to use k-means clustering. Uh, they might not be spherical. And uh, there may be random values which just mess everything up. So let's not be too harsh on k-means clustering. Uh, the implementation is extremely simple. You basically import NumPy and uh, k-means from scikit-learn, which is what everybody needs to do. And then you load your data, and that's it. So uh, I can give this to you later. But now I want to move on to PCA. And PCA is really based on the concept of variance. So uh, how many of you are familiar with the concept of variance or standard deviation in statistics? OK, great. So um, I, I want you to be able to think about variance not as some annoying formula with squares and stuff, but as, as a real measure of how things are spread out. So um, 
Variance actually translates to something, it's kind of an abstract concept of how much information is represented in that data. If you think about it, if things are more spread out, there's more information in them, right? Because you need to know how they're spread out and things like that. If everything, if all of us are in one point and are, are at one spot in this room, there's less information about our locations. But if we're all spread out, there's more variance and there's more information to think about. So um, now I'm going to talk about directions in information. And that's what PCA is really based on. So the informativeness of a direction can actually be kind of quantified using variance. So I'm going to say that the most informative direction is the direction in which the data is most spread out. And the least informative direction is the one around, along which it isn't spread out. So how does this really help us? It's, just bear with me for a second. So let's look at um, the projections along the height axis and the weight axis of our same old birds. Uh, what you're going to see is that they kind of separate out into clusters along both of these axes, right? They vary along both of these axes. So if you were to talk about what kinds of clusters are forming along two axes, you would actually be identifying four different clusters, two along each of the axes, right? Now, um, Look at the variance. It kind of gives you a similar indication of how things are spread out along both of these axes. So I've basically taken the variance of all of those x coordinates, and that's coming out to be 15.2, and all of those y coordinates, the weights, and that's 19.36. It's, it's varying along both these directions. Um, you need both directions to explain it, right? And in n dimensions, here's where the problem exists. If you had, say, 100 dimensions, and you wanted to explain the variance along each of those directions, you would basically need 100 different variances. And you're not really reducing how your data is manifesting, right? You're not reducing what you need to think about. So what if we didn't? Um, so think about this hybrid direction. I've just picked it kind of randomly. And we're going to project the points back down. And this is where things will start making sense. And now you're going to look at the coordinates along that projected direction, which is, for that point, it's 11.6 units. And the variance of these projected coordinates is actually 27, which is significantly larger than either of the ones along height or weight. And that tells you that this direction actually is explaining a lot of the information as opposed to using the two standard ones of height and weight. right? So. That's the comparison. It's 27 versus 15 and 19. And if you actually cluster those projections, you're going to see that now you need only one direction and the projections on that direction to actually identify your two clusters of male and female that we talked about before. So I hope you're starting to see how this can be useful. In, in large numbers of dimensions, you can actually reduce what you need to be looking at. You can look at one number instead of 15 or 20 or 30 or whatever. So um, yeah, so uh, we center the data. That's something that you do uh, to help the actual PCA algorithm so that you can identify directions that are uh, going through the origin instead of having things um, uh, uh, displaced from the origin. And then you can find uh, various directions in a high dimensional space. They're going to be like n directions, right? You can actually order them by the variances that they're explaining. So principal component analysis basically uses linear algebra to just do all of this for you, all of this stuff that I said, oh, what if you had an imaginary direction? It just finds that direction for you. It finds the coordinates of each of your points, each customer, each bird, whoever, in that space. And that happens extremely fast. So Here's what uh, the algorithm actually does. Uh, you give it all of your data, which is in a d-dimensional space. And then you give it usually d2, which is a smaller number of directions that you want to find. And then it just gives you these d2 new directions. And it gives you the coordinates of your various points along those directions in such a way that those directions actually explain most of your variance. So if you, if you think about it, that identifies for you the critical differences in your data set. And it says, hey, we don't have to look at the height and weight for all of these birds. We kind of find this hybrid combination of height and weight. 
And we see how that hybrid combination explains the real separation of your data set into various clusters or components or any of this stuff. Uh, it does this using um, uh, linear algebra, like I said, so we don't need to get into that. But I want you to be able to think about the intuition so you can use it. Uh, so if you think about it, reducing how many directions you need to think about is a great way to extract features out of your data space, right? Instead of looking at 10 things, if you can look at two, that is automatically a better feature because it actually explains your data set. Um, behavior classification can be done in a similar way because with clustering, you relied on the distance metric, but with PCA, you can now look at different kinds of behaviors along a direction of features that explains the best behavior, uh, the uh, similar behaviors. Uh, it's a great way to explore your data because it shows you what directions are, uh, are most important. And I'm going to show you this in the Netflix example. Uh, and it's also preliminary processing for a lot of different uh, data analysis um, uh, purposes. So it does have some limitations. There's no guarantee that if your data set has maybe a true direction, there's no guarantee that PCA is actually finding that. Uh, it does depend on the structure and the topology of your data, and it requires normalization. But if, I'm, I'm sure it's obvious here that the limitations of PCA are much less um, significant than the ones of k-means, where you literally need to have the distance mean something important. Um, it is a black box. You can't go in and fiddle with it and say, wait, why doesn't this do X? You put it through, uh, you put your data through PCA and it gives you those directions and those variances. So this is how you would implement PCA. The code is, again, fairly straightforward. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the demo and the Netflix problem. So Netflix knows what movies you've watched and it knows what movies everybody who has Netflix has watched, right? And they'd like to recommend to you movies that you are likely to want to watch. So how do they do that? They can find, um, I mean, if you had k-means clustering, you would again require these movies to make sense in terms of distance. Like how far is Reservoir Dogs from any other movie? I don't know. But with PCA, what you can do is you can find the directionality of which movies actually explain differences in your data set. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So um, I hope it's clear why k-means clustering is not going to be helpful here. And then what's left is to do the demo. So um, here's the code. Whoops, I forgot how to spell Python. Ha, huh. so um, what we're going to do is, uh, oh, it's not showing. Whoops. OK. Um, that's unfortunate, but then I guess, uh, OK. Um, we're going to have to skip the demo. But uh, I, will, I will then tell you what um, exploring this, uh, this data space using PCA actually revealed when I did uh, the analysis. And uh, this brings me to what's the story, right? Because every data set has a story. What was the story with the Netflix data set? What I found was that uh, the movies that actually explained the variance of the data set were not all movies that we've heard of. They were a lot of, um, a lot of random films that I haven't heard of. But uh, one of them was Reservoir Dogs, which I personally like. And once I started going to the IMDb and Wikipedia pages for these movies, I found out that I found out something that makes a lot of sense. A lot of these movies are either cult classics, so they have like this huge niche following, which is why they explain so much of the variance in the data, right? Because some people are really, really passionate about them, are giving them high reviews, and a lot of people actually haven't even seen them. And the others are either critically acclaimed and failed at the box office, or critically um, completely hated, but amazingly did well at the box office, because who would have thought that? So this is one of the reviews for one of those movies, which says, uh, yeah, four out of 10, I hated this, but it's great for old fans of the show. It was based on a TV show. So that kind of tells you how um, PCA is identifying what's being polarized here. And I haven't told 
the algorithm anything. All I've given it is the data and said, hey, what are the directions that explain the variance of this data set? And it comes and tells me, hey, this movie um, actually explains the variance of this data set in a big way. Uh, another one is, uh, is another film here which says, critics were not impressed, audiences seem to love it, of course. Um, end of Days received mainly negative reviews, but it grossed about $212 million. I wish something that was poorly reviewed of mine would do that well. Um, the majority of critics responded favorably towards the film. However, Roger Ebert, one of the biggest critics, gave it a two-star review. So this is, this is kind of what PCA is capable of, right? It just takes your data and it tells you what explains it. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is Teasney. So Teasney is actually very similar to PCA, but um, it can't reduce uh, to less than three, I mean more than uh, three dimensions. Uh, that's just because of uh, the way the solver is implemented. Uh, but what it does here is, remember the concept of informativeness that I talked about? Uh, it uses a different notion of informativeness. Instead of saying, look at the variance and what direction actually explains the variance of the data, it looks at the probability distributions of the values of different components. So let's uh, look at the distributions of values here. Um, it kind of identifies that there's two points that are similar because they explain each other. They contain a lot of information about each other. And so those two points kind of come at similar points in this distribution along two dimensions. Yeah, and uh, those two come on similar points in the other dimension. So. Um, Teasney is also extremely easy to implement, and uh, it reduces your data again to this similar space. Uh, the, the idea of information theory that it really uses is based on uh, Shannon and entropy and all of this stuff. You can come talk to me about it later if you're interested. Uh, but that brings me to um, the conclusion where um, all of these three algorithms that I talked about were actually implemented in scikit-learn, and it's an extremely powerful library. It's, uh, uh, it's got a huge and brilliant community, uh, active development. And uh, that's why to be a data scientist, you basically just need this. Um, so uh, if, if you're interested in actually understanding your data, all you really have to do is find the name of an algorithm and go to scikit-learn. Push your data through it and see what it's doing. Look at the space. Use matplotlib. Plot whatever you need to. Read the documentation. Read it again. Go look at a blog. And um, it's actually as easy as that. So um, thank you. And uh, I have not, I, I've tried to like toe the line between scientific rigor and intuition. So I'm not sure how well that worked here. But um, this is one of my favorite cartoons that actually makes light of that. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Um, questions? Hands? Um, I really loved your talk. It was amazing. Um, I just wanted to know when have you actually used k-means and why did you use it if you don't like it? Um, I, I don't not like it actually. Like, Sorry, like I said, we not shouldn't, don't like it. We shouldn't be mean to k-means clustering. Uh, it's an extremely powerful algorithm, algorithm, excuse me, in any sense where distance is a reasonable metric. So uh, I think when, when you start looking at, um, at things like the Netflix problem, or say, um, uh, so, so k-means is used for, um, for uh, automatic loan approval, right? It's used to classify customers according to whether they've been paying their bills on time and things like that. But what if you had information on customers in, in abstract senses, like um, how many kids they have, or um, how, uh, or like the approximate standard of living that they have, or the area, or the affluence of the area that they live in. It starts to kind of become murky if you say, oh, we're just going to give a number to each of those things, and then say, oh, what's the distance between the points representing all of those numbers? It starts getting a little murky when you go with that assumption for too long. So in those senses, I would say that um, k-means can probably still do an OK job, but it might miss out on, on, um, on the nuances of the data that would be better explained if you could look at really what what features are actually important to explain what's happening? It sounds like, well, the first two, I kind of understand the last one I don't. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like both of the first two deals with 
with linear relationships? Because there's nothing non-linear about how the classification occurs. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that so is, that, that, that's, a, that's somewhat accurate. The, the, what PCA really does is um, to kind of identify this multidimensional ellipse or like oval in which the data is, is, is mainly existing. And then it says, oh, like an ellipse has maybe two directions that determine it. It says, oh, in the n-dimensional space, the ellipse is kind of this direction and that direction and this direction and kind of tells you how spread apart they are along each of those. So um, it would not capture uh, non-linearities on a global sense. Like if you had maybe, an, like if you had two ellipses, PCA would say, okay, I'm just gonna take like a, a random kind of intersection of those two. But um, if, if you just have one ellipse and there's local non-linearities, like things don't linearly make sense, that would be okay. PCA would be able to do okay with that. So this is just a question to maybe understand um, what you meant answering your question. Um, the, and I, I guess it will boil down to a yes-no answer maybe. Um, is in the k-means, when you, when you sort of um, mentioned one of his limitations, it, it, you, you spoke about a, a, a distance problem yeah. when assigning random numbers to sort of classes or films. Mm -hmm. um, do you mean to say that PCA sort of um, is insensitive to that kind of random association with numbers or numerical assignment to, to let's say, something that you can't really say what the distance is? Um, so it, it, by rotating data in a, in a, in a dimensional uh, sense. So I, I'm not sure because uh, I, I've tried to be more intuitive about this, so I, I think uh, when, when intuitive questions pile up, like you have to kind of go back to the math to understand exactly what's happening. But uh, to try and uh, answer your question, I would say that um, any algorithm is basically as good as, is, is going to do as good of a job on the data as the data is already. So um, k-means can actually do really well on certain kinds of data, but on the assumption that the distance makes sense. So PCA just doesn't think about distance, but there are obviously data sets that PCA would also not do a good job on, like data sets that are just um, extreme values along like 10 different dimensions would, would probably suffer because there's no way to kind of contain that information in an ellipse, right? So um, the, the key difference I think would be to, to just think about whether uh, points that are similar in your space are necessarily going to be close to each other distance-wise, or are they going to kind of have similar orientations? That's where you would differentiate between uh, which one to use. And uh, with, the, with the movie problem, uh, you can't really think of somebody who likes similar movies being close to somebody who likes some of those movies, but a whole bunch of other movies. They would be really far apart, and the distance just wouldn't, wouldn't make sense there. So it would be, make more sense to say, wait, are both of these guys kind of sort of on similar directions, does a similar direction explain some of their behavior at least? That means the PCA would be more useful. Okay, maybe you kind of already answered my question, but we have a lot of medical data, so some of it's height, weight, blood pressure, and that's nice and, and will work well with this, but the large majority is, is true false values. Do you have a headache? It's symptoms. So how do you typically deal with that? Um, because effectively you could go to 100 dimensions, that's mm -hmm. zero or one, or maybe it can be light, medium, bad, but that's about as much as you get that in that. Would this still work, or how would you approach it? Um, so the great thing about, about PCA is that um, if you say uh, it, it doesn't really, I mean, it does decently with uh, binary information like you're talking about, true and false. For example, with the Netflix data set, all that I have, the data that I have, is um, every user, which is about, I think, a million users, and uh, every movie, which is about 18,000 movies, and I have a zero if the user hasn't watched the movie, and I have the rating from one to five if he has watched it and rated it. So that's all the information I have, which is actually discrete information, right? But all that I did then is subtract the mean rating, so I think it was around 3.5, 3 so I reduce everything by that, and then I keep the zeros as zeros, because I, I look at a zero as no information, so I don't want to think of no information as influencing a direction, right? So a zero actually doesn't influence a direction. So you could actually use this in, uh, high-dimensional uh, discrete information 
to kind of at least identify which, um, which components are basically most significant to, to showing how your, how your patients or uh, whoever are kind of varying. You could use it. If I can just add to your great answer to your question, um, PCA will always firstly use um, the line that explains most of the variance in the data. So it's very sensitive to that first point uh, of most variance. And by default, the next component will always be perpendicular to that. So yeah. what the first component of most variance is will determine the other perpendicular lines unless you specifically said it otherwise. So you have to say whether you think that your components will be correlated with each other. Um, like, for example, medical data, that would often be the case. Um, you might have obesity being correlated with diabetes, all kinds of other symptoms, um, whereas in other factors, you would expect uncorrelated components. And that can make quite a big difference in how it determines those components. That's right, yes. Um, PCA would uh, do a good job of, of what you need to, uh, of your application, based on what I can see. I can talk about it. Sorry, just to add to what she said, I think um, when you're considering your output of true or false like mm -hmm. that, there is there's a way you have to choose the proper um, tool or algorithm to use. Uh, in that case, in the case of the medical thing, where you have to consider the output, I would suggest you use LDA, which yes. is a list, yeah. Yeah. instead of PCA, because um, P LDA will look at the output, that's the classification, true or false, why PCA wouldn't be looking at that. Okay, I, I need to clarify. Uh, extremely valid uh, suggestions from both of these uh, people, but uh, I would suggest PCA to actually understand your data set in, in terms of insight. If you're using uh, a prediction algorithm, I would say that um, you shouldn't really use it to, to actually generate predictions in this discrete sense. But uh, since it seems that you're from a medical background where the insight would be as important as building the prediction um, pipeline, uh, I think PCA would be useful to you in identifying really which of those, um, which of those uh, factors that you're getting binary information on is explaining your data set. That w is where it would come in handy, not, um, not really for prediction purposes. I'm trying to get the hands of people. Thanks. Uh, if it's used for pre-processing pre uh, uh, data for modeling, uh, once you have got your component that explain the data and you fit it to whatever model you're using, how do you then interpret that? Because you have kind of like reduced your initial data set. How do you go back now to your initial data set and explain whatever model you used? So, um, I mean, this, this is kind of like asking uh, the second layer in a neural network, wait, how do you, like, how does this make sense based on the original stuff? The, uh, the kind of the point with PCA is that it works well. We, we know for a fact that it works well in, in the kinds of context that I explained. So, um, when other things aren't working, you try PCA, and when it works well, then you say, hey, if I'm actually doing better on my predictions by selecting features based on what PCA recommends, then uh, PCA is actually true to the original data set. But if PCA isn't doing a good job, and there are cases where that could be happening, then you don't, you don't use it. Because like I said, it, a PCA is a little bit of a black box, kind of like a neural network where you kind of just train it on the data and you say, hey, it's doing a good job. Great. So uh, in terms of actually relating it back to uh, what the data represented, you either use PCA to explore the data and understand it, and then use a different algorithm that reflects your understanding of it, or you use PCA to just identify features and crunch numbers and get predictions. And if those don't work, then PCA doesn't do a good job. It's as simple as that. Okay. Thanks. Um, in your experience of using PCA, um, if you've got a data set with 100 dimensions, about how many dimensions can you reduce it to? Are you looking at um, you can yeah. reduce it to as many d dimensions as you want. 
Uh, the nice thing about PCA is that it, it actually gives you uh, the reduced dimension space in order of the variance, that, like in order of explained variance. So um, typically, you would try to start with as large a number that is computationally feasible, and then try and decrease it from there, because you don't want to start with a small number, like five dimensions out of 100, and then go up to seven and say, yeah, that's enough. But um, with, with experience, pretty much like neural networks, with experience, you can usually kind of ballpark a figure that would make sense and would be enough for the purposes that you're looking at. Because um, you can get information in, in the exploratory sense. You can get information and understand your data set better with as little as five dimensions. Because uh, the five directions that PCA identifies are going to be combinations of, direct, of different axes that you actually relate to. For example, those movies that I showed you the ratings of, those were the top five, um, those were the largest magnitudes of the first principal component. So those were those movies. I just needed one principal component, which is identifying one direction, to identify that these six or seven movies, um, the ones that I showed, are like cult movies or have gotten extreme reviews and box office performances. Well, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to understand something. Um, so to get your principal component, you're looking at linear combinations of your individual um, dimensions within your data. Does this mean you inherently penalize nonlinear relationships within your data set? Um, Are there ways around that? No, because uh, like I said, the, the nonlinear relationship in the data set is not really something that PCA is trying to identify all it's, it's kind of looking at the global shape of of all of the data in that space so you can have local nonlinear relationships and you can have that still contained in this multi-dimensional ellipse right so PCA would still identify the directions the same way but uh, if you're going to use it to um, if, if you're going to use it to identify features then nonlinearities are always problematic so you would really have to go on a case-by-case -case basis and see whether the features that PCA is identifying are reflecting those nonlinearities. Because by nonlinearity, you basically mean that, sure, all of the data might be in this huge ellipse, but locally, the things that you care about are, are not like separable by just planes, right? They're going to be weird boundaries between them. So that's kind of like, it, it's, a, it's another level of abstract questioning, because PCA is going to tell you, wait, how are things spread out? But it isn't necessarily looking at how things are related to each other inside small um, interactions. Uh, thanks a lot. I uh, particularly appreciated the really intuitive explanation you gave of PCA. Thank you. Um, so something, I really like PCA, but I was wondering in your experience, have you come across examples where it's appeared to work well, you've got a very reasonable set of like eigenvalues and the seems to make, the components seem to make sense, but then it's turned out like the results have been complete rubbish and they actually actually don't give you good features to put into another model or um, you know, that, don't actually a, help. That, that's a really good question actually. Um, so in my experience, I've used it more for um, the, the data exploration and insight extraction kind of applications, uh, but I, uh, I, can, I can tell you almost for sure that um, just like k-means, if you just rely on PCA to extract features and say, yeah, well, the statistics work out and this is going to be a great feature forever, you're probably going to have problems at some point. So I would say uh, if, you're, if you're just putting something into production and it's going to keep running forever, I would say don't use PCA un unless you can remember to check on it once in a while. It's, it's, like, a, it, if it's like a kid in a room that's been silent for too long. You just don't want to, you, you don't want that situation. Yeah, don't, don't rely on it forever. I, I would recommend actually using it to understand your data and then uh, in a lot of cases using another algorithm to actually make your predictions. In a lot of cases, uh, that would probably be the best way to go. Cool. Let's thank Abir again. All right, thank you. Some announcements, so it is now morning tea and coffee.